Yes, so to John chapter number 11, please. In your Bibles this morning, John 11, we're going to be looking at a message entitled, Death Ain't No Big Deal. Everybody say that with me, death. Preacher, you're not supposed to say ain't, all right? I ain't going to say it no more. So I will say it again and again today, if you don't mind or whether you do mind. Death is not a big deal. This is, this is going to be one of the most encouraging messages I've ever preached in my life. It's all about death. And now you say, well, man, I wasn't prepared for that. Well, the Lord knew that you needed to hear this, I suppose. You know, sometimes we don't say what we mean to say. And sometimes we can't remember what we should say. You ever had that trouble? Susan and I went Friday. We were able to go Friday and be with uh, some of our grandkids up in Wichita Falls. And it was Grandparents' Day. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, did that around here as well. And we went, and we're sitting in this big, in this gymnasium at a table waiting for the kids to show up. We're waiting on uh, the most cute, uh, the, the cutest granddaughter in all the world, waiting on Bryn. And, um, and, and, and we were really nervous because we're not around her a lot, so we weren't even sure she'd come to us. Uh, but we're sitting there, and I'm looking around at all these people, and I'm like, I, told, I said, do we look like these people? <laughs> She's like, yep, we do. And then Friday night, went to the football game to watch Boston play football, and we walked up, and the lady just said, okay, the senior price is, I'm like, this is just wrong. <laughs> I can remember when they used to ask us, are you seniors? Now they're like, you're barely alive, we'll let you in for nothing. <laughs> I'm like, my goodness, what, my how, and it's all me, by the way, I would just say, it's all me, because they know they have to ask her. Uh, we go to a bar now, they still card her. <laughs> That's a joke for you visitors, all right, just so you know, okay? Well, I, just things change. I was listening to the radio this week, and a man was talking, and he said, he said he went to the grocery store. It's a true story. He went to the grocery store this week. And, and, and again, for our students, my apologies because you guys are smart. But when you reach our age, some words just don't come to your brain. They just do not come to your brain. And you, no matter what medications you take, you know, it doesn't matter. And so this guy was at the grocery store, and he was there to pick up syrup, pancake syrup. And he was walking down the aisles, and he could not think of what it was called. And a lady saw him that worked there, and she's like, sir, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, where's your pancake sauce? <laughs> she's like, do you mean syrup? He goes, that's the word? Yeah. It's a true story. He could not think of the word syrup. So um, anyway, we're at that age. Jesus, everything he said, he meant to say. He didn't say, oh, shouldn't have said that. Or he didn't, and not one time did he ever say, something that he didn't mean. In John chapter number 11 is the story of Lazarus. Very familiar story. Everyone's heard about Lazarus. Lazarus was a very dear friend of Jesus. He and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, were close friends of Jesus. Every time they would go to Bethany, that's where they would stay. They would camp out there in their home and then make their way into Jerusalem. It was a short trip, and they would spend time there in the house of uh, Jesus and the disciples would hang out at Mary and Martha and Lazarus home. There was this time that Lazarus got sick. Jesus wasn't in town. He was out of town, and he was not only sick, but he was deathly ill. And so they said to, they said to uh, a servant or, or, or a friend or someone, went and found out where Jesus was and gave him the message that Lazarus is sick, and you got to come now. You have to come now. Now, I want you to see what happens. Let's go. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary, and, his sis, and her sister Martha. It was Mary, which anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. How many of you know what happens in this story? What happens to Lazarus? He died. And yet Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. What Jesus means by that, it's not an accidental statement. What he means by that is that the ultimate, the ultimate outcome of this event in Lazarus' life will not be death. 
though he's going to face death and in fact is going to die. He doesn't say that at this point, but he does say this is not unto death. The, the objective and the goal of this, of this sickness, I'm so glad that Jesus knows everything and that he full well, even as the God man on this earth, he knew everything about every situation. He knew when the servant was going to arrive. He knew when Lazarus was going to die. He knew what was going to happen after Lazarus died. Jesus had the entire situation under control, right? Hello, right? So what that means for you is the difficulty in your life right now and the tragedy or the uncertainty or the, uh, the, uh, the, the trial that you're going through in your life, God knows every, every aspect about that. He knows the outcome. He knows how you're going to get through. He knows everything about your life and the situation that you are facing. And I'm so glad to know that we have a God who's fully aware and can handle those things. So they, this is what happens. Verse number uh, five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. That doesn't make sense. That's a God thing. There's no human explanation for him to get the message, Lazarus is really sick. Oh, okay, be there in a couple of days. When you get a phone call, when you get an emergency phone call that says so-and-so in your family or in your in your sphere of influence, maybe a a neighbor, a friend of yours, someone that you're close to, when the message goes out that they are sick, you don't say, okay, give me a week and I'll be there. What do you do? You drop everything and you go. It's not what Jesus does. The Bible says he waited two more days. Look, and let's go on and read. It says, and his disciples said unto him, master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee there, And goest thou thither again? That's a nice way of saying, have you lost your mind? The last time we were there, they tried to kill us. And you want to go back there? Can you feel their love for Lazarus? Don't judge them too harshly. Because you're not willing to get out of your comfort zone to go to where your life could be in danger. Are you? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone who, was, who you knew would be a threat to your life? I mean, think about it. Here, they're, they're, they're speaking from humanity. They're speaking from emotion. They're speaking out of fear. They're like, you know, maybe we ought to think about this thing about going back there. I, I'm, I wonder if the conversation, I'd love to know. Maybe they said, you know, we have some stuff to do here. Why don't you go? And we'll wait for you here. They're like, you know, this is, that's dangerous. It's a dangerous place. And Jesus answered in verse number nine, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there's no light in him. What does he mean by that? What, a, what an odd statement. That, Lord, that, that, that just does not fit. Oh, yeah, it does. It fits. What he's saying by that, he's simply saying, hey, listen, listen, the people in the light don't need us. People in darkness do. And you've got to go, even if it's dark, because God will be the light that will lead you through that. You've got to keep going. You can't just sit by the wayside and say, well, I'm going to wait till circumstances are better. Now, again, there are times we don't walk into a fire necessarily, but, but, but I'm saying simply, he's saying we need to be wise in what we do, but we need to continue to do what we're called to do, even, then it, even when it doesn't make sense. These things said he, after, uh, after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Now, what does that mean? By, what does that mean? Lazarus is dead. He hadn't even got the message yet, but he knows that Lazarus is dead. But I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. I love this. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, write down three things. And I am flying through because I'm going to, I want to get to the point of this message. I got three things and then three things. Okay. So here we go. Number one, this is what really jumped out at me. Three things about the love of Jesus in this passage, because the love of Jesus is found all throughout this. 
and, 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 and some of the things that we see that demonstrate his love really pr- probably don't make a whole lot of sense to us. Number one, number one, he waited for the right time. He waited for the right time. He waited for Lazarus to die. He says, he's asleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. well the, if, 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 you know, sleep is good for somebody that's sick. They need their rest. They need to re, recoup their energy. And they, need, and, and they didn't understand. And Jesus, verse 13, howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he spoke of him taking rest and sleep. And then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus. And this is one of those statements that you think, I don't think he meant to say this. Oh, but he did. Then said Jesus plainly unto them, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. We're like, what have we got to do with this? Look what he says. To the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Nothing. There is, there is, there's no barrier that our God cannot break through. There is no circumstance in your life, no matter what it is, that is beyond his power. Isn't that good? I don't think you, oh my goodness. There is no circumstance in your life, no circumstance in your life that is beyond his power. Now allow me to put this down. And as we say to our children, don't make me get it again. (laughs) Honestly, we live such powerless lives. We have such a lack of faith in God in the circumstances of our lives. And Jesus has the nerve to say he's waited intentionally on purpose. You say, is that an act of love? Absolutely. Because God is willing to allow difficulties to come into your life so that he can make you stronger in your walk with him. So that he can make you more powerful in your witness for him. That's what this is about. This is, about, this is an investment in the lives of the disciples and in Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They will never forget. I mean, we say things like, I was there when, and we can talk about different things. We were there. I was there when this happened, and I remember this, and I was there. Can you imagine the rest of their lives to say, I was there when Lazarus was flat out dead. In fact, they had already buried him but I saw him walk out of that grave. Oh my goodness, how powerful is that? He waited. He waited until he could show real love to them. He waited until he could show great power and authority. He could have come earlier. Could have done that. He could have saved them the heartache, but he didn't. The fact is he wants us to know that he knows. Everybody say, God knows. Say it again, God knows. God knows this life is filled with heartache. It's filled with difficulty. It's filled with loss. Right, Miss Linda? It's buried her mom this week. This is real. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where, this is, and and the Lord said, I know and I want you to understand that God knows that life is filled with heartache, that life is filled with difficulties, and and there are times of loss and times of uncertainty, but Jesus will still be there. He will still be faithful. He waited to show his love, and I would just say maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're in a, you know, God has a waiting room. Nobody likes waiting rooms, right? Right? Because you don't know what other people have. You're sitting there. Some of them are coughing and spitting and hacking. And it's just, it's just no fun waiting. How many of you do not like to be in a waiting room? None of us. We don't like it. We don't like it. But sometimes God puts us in a waiting room. Not a fun place to be. But <laughs> don't mistake your waiting for God not working. I just thought of that. That's good. Don't mistake your waiting for God not working because God's always working. Oh, I just love this. This is so good. So, number one, he, he waited. Secondly, Jesus wept. 
he wept. Let's go on and read down through the passage. It says that Jesus said plainly to them in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And Thomas, which is called Didymus, uh, said unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What a powerfully brave statement from the doubter. It's true. I mean, he threw that out there. That's pretty good. Maybe he, was, uh, maybe he was threw it out there so maybe Jesus would say, hey, guys, y'all don't have to go. But he said, let's go. And uh, let's go on. When Jesus came, the Bible says when he came that he found that they had laid him in the grave four days already. Now, Bethany was nigh into Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, a few miles away. <clears throat> Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Mary stated, she's still in the house. And then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, boy, have, we haven't, excuse me, who hasn't said this before? God, if you'd have been there, God, if you'd have shown up in time, she says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother had not died. Lazarus wouldn't have died if you'd have been here. But I know that even now, I, what an act of faith and a statement of faith. I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Is that boldness on her part? What, what do you think she's asking for that? What do you think she's saying? Huh? Yeah. What do you think she's saying? If you want to, you can raise him from the dead. She's saying that. And the disciples haven't said that. What they said is, well, maybe we shouldn't go back there because they want to stone us. But she says, Martha says, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But I do know that whatever you ask of the Father, he'll give it to you. And Jesus said unto her, and there's a, there's a journey here. He said, thy brother shall rise again. And she said, I know, verse 24, he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said, and if you didn't know this before you got here, you need to know it now. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm, uh, let, me, let, me, let me read that again and don't get my sign. So respond to that. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, shall never what? Shall never die. Did y'all see that? And then he said, do you believe this? Look at me. Look right here. Do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that? He that believes in Jesus Christ, places his faith in him, shall never die. You say, well, preacher, you had two funerals this week. Yeah, but those people are more alive. In fact, uh, there's a song, Jake, um, Jake Hess. He's dead, but he's with the Lord. He's in heaven. <laughs> but he sang a song, and Susan and I were driving to Wichita, and we heard, we heard it on... on uh, Enlighten, the Enlightened Station. The song is entitled, Death Ain't No Big Deal. I love that song. Mark, you know that song? Mark. Here, come down here and get, he's like, oh, oh he's afraid I'm going to ask him to come sing it. He goes, no, not really. <laughs> Someday when I take my final breath and the doctor takes one look and says, you're dead, the truth is going to finally be revealed. Oh, I'm going to find death ain't no big deal. He'll reach down and gently close my eyes. This is my favorite line. I'll be watching from the other side. Isn't that cool? Woo, I love that, man. I just, that just excites me. Can you imagine? You're laying there in the bed, and you're about to take your last breath, but you're up in heaven watching it. Yeah, that, that's my favorite part. I must like it a lot better than you. He'll reach down and gently close my eyes. I'll be watching from the other side. I'll be laughing about how scared I thought I'd feel. Oh, I'm going to find out. Death, it ain't no big deal. Then he says, my soul is going to be just like a bird set free. I'll sail right past the moon on to the stars. And I know I'll be amazed when I get to heaven's gate. Because I knew my way home by heart. The light will shine much brighter than the sun. And this is good too. Listen to this. 
and I'll be right back where I started from. You get that? That's where we came from. And if you're saved, that's where we're going again. Isn't that good? Ain't no way to tell you how I feel. I tell you, children, death ain't no big deal. Woo, I like that. Don't you like that? Now, I didn't say I sang it good, but don't you like the song? That wasn't half bad, was it? There's some, there's some notes in there that are a little flat and stuff. I did good, huh? You, did, you want to come try? No, all right, okay, all right. <clears throat> if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're headed for hell. I wish I could soften it up for you, but there's no softening. There's no other way to say it then if you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life and never received his payment, repented of your sin, and received his payment on the cross for your sin, if you've never done that, if you take your last breath here right now, hell will be your place of dwelling for all eternity. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live Ooh, I'm alive today. I love that. I love that. Let's go on. And we hadn't even got to the second point. Jesus wept. She said, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, that should, which should come into the world. And when he, she had said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. She, as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Jesus was not yet coming to the house, but it is in the place where Martha met him. The Jews which were, which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the grave to weep. But that's not where she was headed. When Mary was come where Jesus was, she saw him, she fell down at his feet, and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother not died. Does that sound familiar? Somebody else just said that, didn't they? This, this, was, a, this was a theme of the family. Jesus, you know how many meals we fed you? Listen, be careful with this, Christian. Be careful with this. You know how much we've done for you? Lord, you know how much we've done for you? And this is what I get? Now that's, you say, well, that's not what they're saying. I think that's what they're implying. You could have been here. You could have done something about this. The last four days of weeping and crying and watching our brother take his last breath... Lord, we've, we've been here. We've opened our home to you. We fed you meals. We protected you. We've loved you. We, we, we're your friends. God, and, and, and listen, our churches are filled with people who have this very mentality. God, I've done this for you. Now you owe me. Write this down if you're taking notes. God owes you nothing. The fact that you're taking a breath today is a gift from the Lord. Don't think for a moment that God owes you anything because he does not. I mean, he doesn't owe us anything. His grace, the fact that he would extend grace to us and love us and use us and allow us the privilege to serve him is a gift from the Lord. We should never be in a place where we think God owes us anything. He doesn't owe us an explanation. He doesn't owe us an apology. He doesn't owe us anything in the world. And she said, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And listen, you don't think God cares about your tears? The Bible tells us, let's go on and read. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And the Bible says, verse 35, Jesus wept. He cried. Why? In the world would he cry? He knows what's about to happen. He knows that they're hurting. He knows the situation. He's well aware. He weeps with them. He weeps for them. Just like he weeps with you. And he weeps for you. He weeps so that you and I will know. Mourning, listen, if you're taking notes, remember this. Mourning is not, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Mourning is not disbelieving. Mourning is understandable. 
God does not get, he's not disappointed in us when we mourn. Flooded eyes do not represent a faithless heart. A person can enter a cemetery, Jesus certain of life after death, and still have a, an overwhelming crater of brokenness in their heart. We can, we, can, it's, we can believe and yet struggle at the time of a loss. God understands that. And I would say this, as someone said, his tears in John eleven thirty five 35 you, give you and I permission to shed our own tears. We get permission, if you will. Grief does not mean you don't trust. It simply means you can't stand the thought of another day without the Lazarus of your life. That's a reality. We understand that. If Jesus demonstrates his love in any way here, he demonstrates it by his tears. He wept. And let me give you the third thing. He waited. He wept. And then he went to work. <laughs> he went to work. I love it. Don't you? I love it. Let's see what he did. Uh, let's go to verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself. He came to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Let me tell you something. God's not afraid of dead stuff. Little boy had a cat, and the cat died. Mom was trying to comfort the little boy. He said, baby, don't worry about it. Your cat's in heaven. And the little boy said, Mom, what does God want with a dead cat? God can handle dead stuff. He said, take away the stone. They said, he's been dead for four days. <clears throat> and Jesus said unto her, didn't I just say to you, now that's paraphrase, didn't I just tell you, said not I unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. They took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. We hadn't seen him talk to God one time. Oh, yeah, he has. We haven't seen it. We haven't heard it. But see, Jesus understood what it, meant to, what it means to be in an attitude of prayer as you go through life. No doubt, no doubt, listen, Jesus is seeking the will of the Father while he's making his way to, to Bethany. Father, the, the disciples are talking. They're on that journey, that few-mile journey. They're on their way to the to the house father if it be thy will can we raise Lazarus from the dead that conversation listen when you're going through life oh man preacher I've just got to stop but you know at night when I say my prayers you should be in an attitude of prayer at all times because here's what Jesus said Jesus said father I've asked you you've heard my prayer and I thank you that you heard my prayer and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So he prayed out loud, and he's praying to the Father, and I thank you that you heard my prayer, Father. And I say that out loud because the people around here are watching. Man, what a principle. People are watching my life, and I want them to know that my faith and my trust is in you, my Father. Ladies and gentlemen, every day of your life, if you're a Christian, people are watching you. You need to be able to say like Jesus, Father, I thank you, maybe not out loud because people think you're nuts. Father, I thank you that you hear my prayer. And Lord, help me to live my life uh, faithfully to you and help me to honor you in my actions today at work and, and in my decisions today. And help me to honor you because people are watching. And I want them to know that I know you so that they too can know you. Jesus is saying, I, I know that you heard my prayer, but I'm saying it out loud so they will know that you heard my prayer. They took away the stone. He prayed that prayer. And when Jesus, excuse me, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. And you've heard it before. He had to say, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he had simply said, come forth, every grave would have opened up. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Lazarus is alive. 
He's got to die again someday. He will. And in fact, because of what happens here, and we don't have time to get into this today, but in verse number 45, it says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believe, did, believed on him. And you go down and it says in verse 47, The chief priests gathered together and the Pharisees a council and said, what do, we, what do we do for this man doeth many miracles? If we leave him alone, the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And they basically come to the conclusion, we need to kill this guy. We need to kill this guy. Why did they want to kill Jesus? Because he was a threat to what they were doing. They were making money off of these people, and now they're converting to him. They're coming to him, and they're losing money. And it was, a th- by the way, money is uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, and that's what's behind it. But they want Jesus out of the way. Listen, here, here's the amazing thing about this, and get this before we go home. Listen, they wanted Jesus out of the way, but guess what? They wanted Lazarus dead too. Look at chapter 12, verse 10. One verse, 12, verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Yeah, that's a big wow. That's a big wow. They don't want just Jesus out of the way. They want Lazarus out of the way. Why? Because he rose from the dead. Because he's a living testimony of the power of God. You know what? I'm telling you, if you are genuinely a living testimony of the power of God in your life, you can rest assured that the, that the demons of hell want you dead. Want you out of the way. But if you're not having an impact, and Satan's patting you on the back saying, you're doing a fine job, keep it up. Because you ain't doing nothing for the Lord. And there's that word ain't again. You're not doing anything for God. If that's your life and Satan is happy with you, listen, if that's the case, you need to know if Satan is happy with you, God is not. So who are you trying to please? All right, three things and I'm done. I got, we got to wrap this up. Here we go. Number one, you ready? Death as we know it is real, but it doesn't have to be. Death as we know it. Is real, but it doesn't have to be. And by that, we simply mean that the fact that you and I, we entered into this world, and if the Lord tarries his coming, you and I are going to take our last breath. I told uh, Austin yesterday, we were talking, and some of the guys we were talking, and I remember Dr. Meyer telling me one time about when he was a young preacher in a church, he, he borrowed a casket from a friend at the funeral home, and he put it up in front of the church on a Sunday morning, and he put a mirror in it. And he had everybody file by and look in the mirror and see themselves in the casket. Deacons were mad at him. Church members were mad at him. He said he got in a lot of trouble for doing that. I, I thought about doing that because I don't care if you get mad at me or not. Because one day, one day, there will be one with your name on it. Death as we know it is real. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9, it is appointed unto man once to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. It is appointed. Death is an appointment, the song says, that we all must keep. But as a child of God, we just close our eyes and simply fall asleep. To be carried away on angels' wings up through heaven's door, where I move right into a mansion and live forevermore. Isn't that good? Death is real. As we know it, death is real, but it doesn't have to be. Let me give you the second thing. Oh, wait, before I do, i got to tell you these. Because when you die, typically they're going to take you out and put you in a cemetery and go put a headstone up. What will your headstone say? Here lies Bob. If your name's Bob, I apologize. I always use Bob. We go to Chick-fil-A. Hey, what's the name? Bob. I don't know who Bob is, but I like the name Bob. Don't call me Jimmy Bob, but I like the name Bob. (laughs) What's it going to say on your tombstone? Here's some epitaphs. They're a little lighthearted. Here lies my wife, Samantha Proctor. She catched a cold and wouldn't doctor. She couldn't stay. She had to go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. (laughs) One man wrote this. 
on his, uh, his, uh, I am not grieved, my dearest wife. Sleep on, I've got another wife. <laughs> Therefore, I cannot come to thee, for I must go and live with she. <laughs> and then I'm not sure about this one. This is a lady, her husband, Jared Bates, died. And she was a widow, and she put this on the tombstone, sacred to the memory of Jared Bates, who died August the 6th, 1800. That's pretty nice. His widow, age 24, lives at 7 Elm Street, <laughs> has every qualification for a good wife, and yearns to be comforted. <laughs> don't you dare put that, don't, don't you do that. <laughs> number, number two. Death is real. We know that. <laughs> Where am I? Oh. Actually, number two is death is real, but it doesn't. It, it, what, what? <laughs> death as we know it is real, but it doesn't have to be. That's actually number two. Number one, I passed, is life as we know it is real, but it doesn't last forever. Life as we know it is real, but it doesn't last forever. Psalm 39, behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. My age and my age is nothing before thee. We think, Brother Lancaster, what an amazing man he is. Almost 91 years of age. He's just like a Timex, man. I told him he keeps a, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. He's got 13 stents in his heart. I told him he's one big giant walking stent. 13 stents. And you go by, I saw him yesterday morning. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Just love that man. But one day, one day, the Lord's going to take him home. Hope it's not anytime soon. One of the best deacons we've got. Loves the Lord, loves people. He loves you people. And I just, we need, life is real as we know it, but it doesn't last forever. Death is real. As we know it. The third thing I want to tell you is that in Jesus, one is just as good as the other. <laughs> one is just as good as the other. And that's what makes the difference, isn't it? When you know Jesus, I mean, honestly, life here life there I love to say it at services at funeral services I love to remind the family that your loved one has left the land of the dying and has now entered the land of the living where death is no more huh what a great thought that is one is just as good as the other Romans chapter 14 Paul said these words in verse 8 and 9, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. <laughs> That's so good. Verse 44 says, And he that was dead came forth. Wow. What a powerful, powerful story. What a beautiful account. Do you know him today? You got a circumstance in your life that you're overwhelmed with? Is your circumstance greater than this one? Our God knows and our God can handle it. Amen? Amen. Let's trust Him. Would you bow your heads, please, for just a moment? 